Before we get started, I would like to uh, welcome and acknowledge City Council Member Nancy Belisich. Dr. Belisich, thank you for joining us. And we also have City Council um, elect Aurelio Gonzalez. Thank you, thank you for joining us today. Um, so what I would like to do is introduce our panelists. We have Nancy Falsich. Falsich. I have to apologize. I just damage everybody's last name. I, and she is the director uh, and founder of Regeneración, Regeneration, which is a Pajar Valley Climate Action, and this was done in 2016. She uh, founded this group with a small group of Bahar Valley residents. She was motivated to work for climate action and resilience upon realizing the plight that younger generations, and this was talked about a little bit earlier, including her nine-year-old daughter and what they will face. Her goal is for everyone in the Bahar Valley to become fully aware of the reality of climate change and to move together to address the causes and fight for justice. Nancy also has served as a bilingual preschool and kindergarten teacher with the Pajaro Valley School District for 19 years. Thank you, Nancy. The next person that we have is my fellow commissioner, planning commissioner, Anna Kamer. And Anna is a retired teacher from the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. She's an avid bicyclist and community activist for safer and more accessible transportation options in Watsonville. She is currently the chairwoman of the Watsonville Planning Commission, and she works to make informed decisions. And let me tell you, this woman is always prepared at every planning commission. She does her homework as she plans for the future. Thank you, Anna. And last but not least, Felipe Hernandez. Felipe Hernandez is a city council member and he was also a former mayor and former planning commissioner. I also have to tell you that I'm his appointed planning commissioner. Thank you. <laughs> he is the founder of Bike Friendly in Watsonville, which seeks to make fun, healthy, safe cycling available to everyone including casual bike rides for Watsonville families, seniors, and kids. He also advocates for bike and pedestrian safety. As so if you know, uh, we've had some uh, pedestrian uh, casualties this last year, and he's very much at the forefront in addressing this. He participates in several groups, including the South Bike um, and Pedestrian Work and South County Open Streets Committee. He was the recipient of the Bike Santa Cruz County, the Wheelie Award for, for being such an advocate of open streets and bikes. Thank you, Felipe. Okay, in order. Thank you. Oh, how about if I hand this mic? Whoever answers the, the question, or if we have a question, I'll have. Okay. Uh, perhaps this one is more for you, Mark. How could our light rail help communities going to Monterey and Salinas? And, and just a reminder, uh, Rachel right here will help us with that. She'll be the timekeeper, and she'll show you the yellow um, card letting you know that you have one minute to wrap it up and you have the orange one to stop. So, <laughs> and we want to be able to ask as many questions as possible. So how could our light rail help communities going to and from Monterey and Salinas? So light rail uh, from here would get you all the way across the bridge to Pajaro, where you would pick up a train to Salinas or Monterey when, when those trains are operational. For the rest of our county, you would hop on a train wherever you could and take it down to Pajaro, and then from there, hop on a light rail system to Salinas or Monterey. So, as I mentioned earlier in my speech, um, TAMSI, the transit agency in Monterey County, 
got it, received a grant to bring Caltrain down to Salinas um, through Pajaro and Catherville. So that will be happening. Um, the long range plan is for ACE, which is the central the train that runs out to central California, and for uh, Capital Corridor also to stop here in Pajaro and uh, Castroville. So the, you are right next to the junction in Pajaro that will allow you to connect not just to those trains, but the trains that serve all of North America. Thank you. Um, so we have two questions here, and I um, I know that you gave them to me in order, but I will mix them up a little bit so to give an opportunity to have the other panelists answer the questions. But again, I believe that this perhaps may be for you, Mark. Um, it's two uh, two questions. Why is there opposition? And I think you covered this a little bit earlier. Why is the opposition? Uh, why is there opposition to putting the trail in its already if it's already been approved, and does the rail easements include trails with rail? So there's two questions. The opposition question I think I did address earlier. I, I'm really, I can't really speak for the opposition. I, I don't understand really why they do what they do. Um, so I'll say that question um, probably doesn't have an answer here tonight unless somebody else here wants to take a stab at it. Um, as, what was the other part of the question? The second part was the easement. Yes, the easements, does, does it so, include uh, the trails with um, rails? So the easements are for the, you know, these are full easements. They're for construction, maintenance, and operation of a, a rail line. So the transit district, when they developed the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network Master Plan, took into account this addition of the trail. So that addition of a trail was was a permit, was a, permitted by the purchase of the line originally. And it's in the agreement we have with the rail operator now. So uh, the simple answer to that question is yes. Adding a trail to the existing corridor is permitted. Thank you. Will proposed trail be wide enough to separate pedestrians from wheeled uh, vehicles, for example, bikes, electric bikes, and um, I can't, one wheels? What was the last one? From wheeled vehicles, bikes and electric bikes, and, <coughs> and I can't read that the last. Thing. You know, I think I think we saw some of the some of the feet separation that some of the trails, the existing trails that we have are, and most of them are eight feet. If you look at our, I think, I believe that our uh, levy trail is also eight feet. And there we have folks that are walking, bicycling, you know, pe people take it both ways, both west and east. There's people, wa there's actually people walking their dogs, there's people bicycling, there's people walking, uh, there's, you know, people, the kids that take skateboards there. So with a 12 foot, that is, you know, an additional uh, four feet, there can definitely be a high amount of both pedestrians, bicyclists, and everything else that, that you know, that's human powered at least, and electric bikes as well. Let me try using, yeah. oh, there we go, it's working oh, there works. And, and keep in mind that, you know, 12 feet's the minimum width, so much of the trail, wherever it can be, will be 16 feet wide. <coughs> Plenty wide enough for multiple uses. Thank you. Okay, maybe we can ask this one to Anna. Better on the spot here. Will it be scary to live near a train? Or to bike na near a train? I, we don't live that close to the train, but having stayed in, you know, places where we were close to trails or train, I, I don't know that it would be scary. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question because what about um, biking? Since you're a uh, okay, next to um, the the thing is, a train stays on a track, so a train is only going to go on that track. Cars are very unpredictable. Uh, humans are unpredictable. And riding on streets is scary. Um, but 
if you have a train on a track and it's going on that track and then you have space and then a barrier, I think it would be, for me as an experienced cyclist, a lot less concerning, um, safety concerning than it would be on the street. So I think a trail would be a safer way and a more, um, you would feel safer and you would feel like it was not scary, I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Maybe this may be for Mark, but maybe somebody else would like to take a shot at it. How many people commute from Watsonville to Santa Cruz every day? Of that data. Um, let's see. Um, so the. De any data that I give you is going to be from the um, the population data from the census, the 2010 census, but it's updated. Um, it's it's projected into up to 2016. Um, let's see. Uh, let me find it. Um, about half of South County residents. So let me go back and, and say this. Um, there are approximately 92,000 residents in the South County, that's in the 95076 and 95019 Freedom Area Codes. And of those people, uh, approximately half of them are workers over the age of 16. 72% of them drive alone to their workplace. So, um, you know, and, and they work all over the county. Many of them work within the Watsonville area. But, can you remind me of the, the other part of the question. Sorry. How many people commute to from Watsonville to Santa Cruz every day? I didn't find exactly how many people commute commute from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, but you know, if seventy two percent of people are driving alone, that tells you that you know a good number, at least a third of those are driving from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. Um, you know, many of my neighbors work in Santa Cruz, so they're you know they're driving every day. Um, it's it's a good number. Thank you. Uh, well, we can... I do have a, a few that you'd like to add. Yeah, I mean, there's been some numbers that have been that actually traversed through Highway One, and they say it's about a hundred thousand cars that go through Highway One right here in front of Watsonville. But you know, I also represent a district that has a lot of people that commute to Santa Cruz, Capitola, Scotts Valley. Uh, a lot of people that I represent in this part of my district work in the service industry, and that's the city of Santa Cruz's number one industry, tourism. So people that work in the hotels, people that work in the restaurants, people that work at the boardwalk, right? That's all the tourism industry that, that is the main economic driver for Santa Cruz. And so a lot of them work in that industry. You go to the back of any restaurant, most likely it's going to be Latino, and you know 80% of them are going to be from South County. Uh, a lot of people that I that in my district that, that live over here behind Target also work in that area, but more in the manufacturing, some tech, uh, out in Scotts Valley as well. So we have a lot of people that work here. I had a group of women that came from Threshold Nutritionals. Uh, it's a vitamin place out here, and you know they had some people that came from Santa Cruz Nutritionals. One's in Scotts Valley, one's in Santa Cruz, I forget which one is which, but they were telling me that they had 400 workers there. No, they had 600 workers there, and about 400 of them are from Watsonville, former cannery workers, because it's the same process. It's uh, manufacturing, right? Making gummy bears and stuff, pills and stuff. So there's a big number of people that work in our, right here in Watsonville, that work in Watsonville. I think we're the backbone. South County's the backbone of the economy in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Okay, Nancy, since you are the environmental expert, <laughs> can the railroad trail and trail withstand a Megan a magnitude, let's say a point eight earthquake? I'm not an expert in that kind of <laughs> environmental question. Um, 
if we have a point, an, an eight point earthquake, eight point earthquake yes. we're going to be in trouble all over the place, I would say. I mean, I do know that things get, have gotten built better in more recent times. So I assume engineers are going to be thinking about that kind of thing. But an eight point earthquake is, is rather destructive. Mark. I'm a, an engineer, civil engineer, spent my entire career designing structures primarily. Um, I was here when the 89 earthquake hit. That earthquake was a 7.1 magnitude earthquake. And I remember very clearly seeing the Highway 1 uh, passes through the slough with the piling, support pilings punching through the deck, rendering Highway 1 essentially useless for, for I don't even know how long it took them to repair that, probably a year or so. Um, 8.0 magnitude earthquakes, those are great quakes. That's, um, that's on, on the magnitude of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, um, not as big as the Anchorage earthquake. These are you know, huge earthquakes. Um, it's very difficult to predict how structures of any type will perform under those circumstances. Um, but I can tell you this, it would be good to have another transportation system. Uh, in case there's damage to one. It's always good to have some redundancy in your transportation systems. So from that point of view, it's always good to have another option. Thank you. All right, so uh, we'll leave this one open to anyone who would like to answer it. The cost of passengers of riding have, that we have heard are pretty high. Um, what do you think about uh, the low income riders? Will they be able to afford $120? or more from I think what we're seeing today and some of the estimates that we, that we have and talking to the folks from Smart, we've seen the range of $2 to $2.50 for record that we saw up here. And I think that that's pretty much on par with what we see with the Metro. And we have a lot of our folks that are low wage workers and folks that work in the boardwalk that take the bus. Uh, there's a lot of programs that we can work together with employers. I know Metro, for example, is working on employer programs for bus passes. And it's something that we could do for people that work from South County, that work in Santa Cruz, to work with employers. But that's something that us as local governments got to work on to give better rates or give better monthly rates as well. Uh, but I think that if folks, can, if folks that work in this sector, in this uh, the, uh, service sector, can afford the metro, I think they'll be able to afford the uh, transit. I think this is a good time to mention that we're just really beginning to see the effects of global warming and the enormous economic impact that that's starting to have. For instance, uh, the winter, um, not this past winter, but the winter before, where I believe it was $100 million in road damage in our county just from a couple of late winter storms. Um, I would be a big advocate of free transportation for low-income people. That is a pittance you know, compared to the cost of greenhouse gases. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is, I understand, did, did somebody want to add something else? No? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the person says, I understand freight has priority over passenger transit using the same corridor. How is this handled to, to maintain a reliable passenger service? So, so freight and passenger rail service coexist on rail lines all over the world. Uh, the smart train that I showed you earlier tonight, uh, they've solved the problem of freight and passenger rail on the same line by, by using what's called a temporal separation and what that means is that while the passenger trains are passenger trains are running no freight is allowed on the track so that means from about 5 a.m. to about 10 p.m. only passenger trains are using that track then when 10 p.m. comes they lock the passenger trains off the track and the freight rail runs at night and that's how they handle freight and passenger rail throughout the world really um, and in today's uh, transportation systems, we have what's called positive train control. And that's now required on all new rail systems. So any rail system we uh, bring into existence in our community will be fitted with positive train control. And that prohibits 
trains from occupying the same track at the same time. So uh, that's what uh, how that would be handled. Thank you. What does the rail line connect us to across the state? Can it take us beyond the state? Uh, I answered that earlier, but I'll answer it again because it's really exciting. Um, this rail line at Pajaro Junction connects you to the entire North American rail network. So from here, you can go anywhere you want in the North American continent. So that includes the United States, Canada, and Mexico. In places like Big Creek Lumber, source you know lumber from Northwest, places like Del Mar, ship you know their stuff far places as well. Uh, I think that it's important, that, I think with freight, I think what's important is that it also serves a, as an economic base here in Watsonville. And it, create, and, it, and it maintains jobs that are union jobs here. From, you know, from Del Mar Foods to, you know, Big Creek. So I, I think it's an important factor to make sure that we do also have transnational transportation through there. But I think what also is important is the connection that you were talking about in terms of the, uh, the TAMSI program wanting to do the, the connect Pajaro to Watsonville because that means that we can go to Monterey, we can go to Salinas, and I think it's also going to connect to Gilroy, San Jose, San Jose to the train there. So it gives us access to Silicon Valley. Uh, so that's what's really exciting about the future with rail. Okay. So just to follow up on, the, on that question, uh, what exactly, what kind of rail project is Monterey ha having? Are, have they decided what they will have? Uh, TMC has a long range plan for light rail into Monterey and for, uh, like I said earlier, they're gonna, they'll be bringing a Caltrain, Pace, and Capital Corridor will all bring trains down into Salinas. So all trains that go to Salinas come through Pajaro. That's where the rail line goes. So from Pajaro, you can go down to Salinas, or, you, or that course, you know, and beyond, you know, Los Angeles, or wherever you want to go. But north, uh, you'll go through uh, Gilroy, Morgan Hill, to San Jose, Deardon Station. From Deardon Station, you'll be able to connect to uh, BART and um, the San Jose VTA light rail and, you know, many other um, rail systems through Deardon. Thank you. And this is also a follow-up question to that. Um, and the, the question is, isn't it a hassle to get to and from a train stop? What if I don't live near a station? And I think that in Watsonville, we, won't, we don't have that big of an issue. But, Anna? Um, th there was uh, actually an article in the um, San Jose Mercury uh, in April. And it, it, that, that's called the first and last mile problem. And um, it... Most people will not travel more by walking or bicycle, connecting from a transit to their work or their school um, or where they're going. About a quarter mile is about the maximum people will, most people will want to travel. But that first and last mile connection can be, um, like you could have Uber, um, you could have maybe a company bus. I, I know that um, my neighbors work at, um, UCSC and they have a van pool, so those van pools, um, instead of going from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, might connect to the train station in Santa Cruz and take people up to the university. So there, there, what, where there's a need, there's going to be, there are going to be transportation options to fill that need, and there is going to be a need along the rail line for those connections, those first and last mile connections, and there will be some sort of transit. Um, that will connect once that rail line goes in place. It's just, you know, the way the market forces fall. I just want to add just a couple of quick stories um, about the way transit is changing. Um, both in Florida and in New Jersey, uh, ahead of California in this regard, instead of building parking lots to serve transit stations, transit operations are subsidizing Uber and Lyft rides. So they're basically, it's, they found that it's less expensive to simply subsidize the Uber ride than it is to build a parking lot. And that's a revolutionary way of thinking about transportation, but that's the kind of thinking that's coming down the pipe. 
And I also wanted to, to just amplify what Anna said. Um, employers have this exactly the same problem. Employers would like nothing more than to operate a shuttle to pick people up at a, at a train stop and shuttle them to their uh, workplace because the employer doesn't have to build a parking lot for the cars. Uh, to give you a very clear example of that, Dominican Hospital in Santa Cruz is essentially, they're out of land. And with the coming need for increased health care in our community, they are trying to figure out how are they going to expand their medical facility and how are they going to park the cars to serve that. And I'm pretty sure they would love to be able to just subsidize an employee shuttle to pick people up at the train station. It saves land and saves money. Thank you. Yes. I, I want to add that I, I think that first and last mile would probably be the least of our problems to figure out. I think there'll be lots of great creative solutions for that. Um, I want to share a quote, which, which I try to keep in mind of where we're at in terms of global warming. So this is where we are. We're stuck between the impossible and the unthinkable. Like it may feel impossible to get people out of the cars or to do something different about the highway, but the, we are between that and the unthinkable, which is that we might destroy the living ecosystem of the, of the planet. So for the rest of our lives, this quote continues, our job is to make the impossible possible. And I'm sure we can solve that first and last mile. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, now, this question is uh, probably for anyone who lives here in Wattsville because it's really <coughs> directed uh, what, more with a focus on Wattsville. How will it affect housing prices in Wattsville, especially for houses near the train station or the trails? I guess I'll take the first time of it because I probably got the housing that's close that in the district where, where most of the rail lines are at. Um, in my five years of representing this area, I've only had one email about a horn that went on in my five years of representing the district that has most of the rail lines. In terms of housing prices, it's never been talked about among, amongst realtors. If not, I think that being that it's uh, close to transit, it might increase the values because there's tra uh, uh, transit lines near it and people want to commute or have the accessibility to rail. So I think it, 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 uh, it only makes it better for uh, housing prices. Yeah, I would agree with that, that I think things are going to be changing rapidly in this next period of time. and. Um, People are worried about housing prices. I would be more worried about houses that are in flood zones, houses that are along the coast. Um, there's probably going to be a big collapse in the housing market before too long because there's a lot of coastal property, not just here, but all over the, you know, the United States and in the world, that's going to become unlivable before too long. Thank you. And here's a follow-up question to that. UC Berkeley studies have found gentrification near transit stations. What can be done to preserve affordable housing? I think that one of the things that we do have to focus on is, and it's you know being talked about in the housing bill is a rail trend, rail oriented development, or transit oriented development. That means putting housing near, near uh, wherever there's bus terminals or the rail lines so that people have access to those. Uh, and I know that some of the dumb that's happened in the Bay Area, that's what's been increasing the, the property values. Um, I think that as, I think local governments really do have to uh, increase affordable housing uh, ordinances in those areas near rail because those are the people that use the bus lines right now. Those are the people that are gonna use the rail lines in the future to work jobs like that the restaurants, the boardwalk. Uh, so I think it's up to local govern governments to, and, and counties as well, to lead us in the direction to put more affordable housing in those areas that are close to rail and uh, different modes of transportation. Um, just that there, 
I, I, I concur and, and would say that um, it's up to local governments to make sure there's a diverse, that, that the housing uh, need, the housing meets a diverse need um, of all incomes. Um, and I, it just makes for better neighborhoods too. So um, just to make sure that there are, it, it's not that the housing near transit, because in, in I lived in Oakland and the housing near transit was very expensive. I and mean, people, it was very desirable to live near transit. So that can happen, but it is up to the local governments to make sure that the diverse um, income levels in a city, its needs are met as far as housing near transportation. Because as uh, Felipe said, I would um, the lower income people as well? Well, and everybody's going to use transit. It does, it's not just lower income; it's everybody. Uh, so it just needs to that the housing needs to be um, meet the diverse income levels. Thank you. So I have a card here, uh, Jack Nelson's comments regarding the first mile and last mile. So and Hooven, Thank you. Can you say it in Spanish? It would be, be easier for me to say it in Spanish. <laughs> Netherlands, the population is 50,000, 400 bikes counted at the train station, and 24 cars. So that shows that people are using it, and it is, uh, once you build it, they come, right? <laughs> so here's a question for Nancy. Um, what are some of the benefits of light trail for families? And would you be comfortable letting your daughter ride the light train, the light rail to Simpkins Swim Center with two or three friends? Good question. Um, I wouldn't send a nine-year-old off with a couple of friends at this point, but you know, in the teen years, I could I could imagine that that kind of scenario. Um, in preparing about for tonight, I was thinking over the fact that there's a lot of children in Watsonville who have never been to the ocean. I think a train to the boardwalk with walking distance you know, from Watsonville to the train station could open up many possibilities. Um, I think this is a good time to tell a little story. Our group, Regeneración, recently carried out a survey of our community to ask about what issues related to the environment are of concern to people and to see what solutions people might support um, to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce pollution. And when um, one of the questions was about having train service on the existing line, and this is anecdotal, but people's eyes lit up when they heard that there was actually a rail out there and there could be the possibility of train service. Okay, Nancy. Yes. Um, <clears throat> on Bike to Work Day, I was tabling out in front of this building and um, the people that came in on their bicycles when, when we talked about, because I'm also a board member of uh, Friends of the Rail and Trail, um, when, people came up and we were talking about rail and trail and, and people, just like Nancy said, I mean, people, rail? Really? Oh, that'd be so great. I mean, in South County, it's really, uh, we've gotten, I'd say, 98% positive reaction to the possibility of transit options on that rail line, so it's, it's great. Thank you. How will the train be able to go both ways with a single tr track, how often will the train be able to run? So the, um, that's a classic question. How can a train go both ways on a single track? And so just, just FYI, most commuter rail systems in the United States, in fact in the world, are single track systems. The smart train that I showed you earlier is a 43 mile long single track system. It, when it's built, completely built out, it will be 70 miles long. And the way you handle two-way traffic on a single track is you have sidings or spurs. Most of the time, those sidings are at stations. So at a station, the train going north or east or whatever, the northbound train comes in, pulls in on one side, the southbound train comes in, pulls in on the other side, and then they pull out together on the same single track. It's a very typical thing to have happen. 
in that same rail trail, uh, rail feasibility study. With the other question was frequency. The, yes. So the, the rail uh, transit feasibility study looked at um, transit, what they call headways, of 30 minutes. So there'd be a train every 30 minutes going in each direction. And that's how the smart train in uh, also works. There's a train every 30 minutes. So that means there's a train going in one direction or the other every 15 minutes. Um, to do that on our branch line, on this rail line, you would need two spurs. <coughs> So if you want to increase frequency to, say, a train every 15 minutes, then you're going to need twice as many spurs. And so it's just a matter of geometry to figure that out. And that's what the train experts do all day long. So it's really not a big deal. Thank you. Of course, not being great at geometry, you know, I, I think I would need a class after that. Thank you. I'm very good at geometry. Most engineers are. Okay. Will there be a speed limit? On the trails, 20 miles per hour. How how would that be? The the uh, right now in the state of California, the what's called a class one bikeway and a multi-use trail. The closest definition in the or in the statewide ordinances is a class one bikeway. So it's se class one bikeway is separated from vehicular traffic. Right now in the state of California, you cannot exceed 20 miles per hour on a class one bikeway. So the speed limit of our trail has not yet been established because it isn't yet built, but we suspect that that speed limit will be 20 miles per hour. Okay, I'm looking at the clock and we only have about five, seven minutes. Um, so I will go ahead and ask a question that was directed for, uh, to Felipe. Felipe, do you think Santa Cruz employers would be willing to subsidize the cost of rail transit for their service workers if it meant being able to hire the workers they need? I think yes. I think there's programs that you know we could do with ridership programs to help also subsidize, but I think employers would definitely want that. Uh, especially, you know, having a hard they're having a hard time as well finding employers, just like work just like the agricultural was having a hard time finding employers. Uh, the tour industry is also facing the same thing because it really is hard work. I don't know if any of you guys got the opportunity to read some of the articles out after Anthony Bourdain passed away, but he talks about how difficult and how hard that work is in the restaurant industry. Um, if you haven't read that, any of his stuff, read some of his stuff, he'll tell you how hard it is. Uh, but I think that it's, uh, Definitely something that employers would, would want to participate in. Um, I know that Metro is starting to get some folks to subsidize some of the some of the bus passes as well. So this is something that large employers like UCSC, UCSC, uh, the City of Santa Cruz, the County, Boardwalk, uh, Threshold Nutritionals, you know, folks that have over a hundred employers could definitely, you know, subsidize uh, service workers, manufacturing workers, uh, even live here in South County. Okay. Um, what about the accommodations for people with disabilities and senior citizens? What do you think the, the tr uh, transit system will make? I'll tell you. Hot potato, right? <laughs> So the Americans with Disabilities Act would require that all public transportation systems are fully accessible. Um, you know, I, I rode the smart train a little while ago, and that train not only does it have a cafe, it also has a fully ADA compliant bathroom on it. When you open the door to that bathroom, I mean, it's bigger than any bathroom I have in my house. It's really nice, and it has all the grab bars, and it's all fully automated. Um, so all public transportation will be fully accessible. Okay. So this is for the two former teachers or current teachers. Many of the PVUSD teachers live in Aptos in Santa Cruz. How would teachers get to their schools from the um, from the metro uh, from uh, the the station? The train station. The train so they station. Take the train down here. There. Yes. Well. 
the district is a very large employer. Um, I would imagine the district would have some sort of um, first and last mile connection with transit. Um, you ride your bike um, in, some, some people are hardy enough to ride in the rain. Others of us <laughs> um, don't do that. But I mean, it, there are several ways that that could happen. But I imagine the district being such a large employer would um, definitely take advantage of the fact that they don't have to provide parking. You know, it's going back to the parking issue. And Parking is um, very expensive um, to provide. And people don't always realize that a parking space, what is it, Rick, you might be able to, $10,000 or something to, it's very expensive to Santa provide Cruz, parking. Santa Cruz proposes $75,000 per parking. Oh, per, per, yeah. It's very expensive to, for uh, you know, a business to provide parking and for cities to provide parking. So taking away parking means you can use that space for other things, maybe another classroom, um, to encourage you know, workers to come. The district used to have a carpool program. They don't anymore, but they used to have a carpool program. But I think they would, that, that would fill, that void would be filled by some sort of transit, uh, first and last mile transit. <coughs> Okay, one last question because I've heard this asked before um, and it's been a concern, uh, especially at the transit, uh, at the Metro Transit meeting. Um, the, the question is, I've heard concern that our rail would transport dirty petroleum chemicals, oil. Um, is this true? This is a concern that's been expressed by a number of people and I will, I will answer it this way. The freight rail needs of our community are based on the businesses in our community. Because there are no businesses in our community that are refining crude oil into gasoline products, there won't be any crude oil moving along our rail line. There's no place for it to go. Our rail line is a dead end. It dead ends in Davenport. And I don't think we're going to be building an oil refinery anytime soon anywhere in our county. Um, nor will we be drilling offshore to, for oil in our National Marine Sanctuary, nor will we be fracking in the San Vicente Redwoods on the North Coast. These, these kinds of uh, fears are real, uh, but they're unfounded in reality. So uh, I just don't think it's realistic to, to think that we will be moving toxic petroleum products along our rail line. I will say that right now you have a biofuels facility right here in Watsonville called Agron. Agron Biofuels, which is located on Beach Street, they are converting soybean oil, which is grown in the Midwest, in Iowa, and Kansas, and in the Midwest. It's loaded on tanker cars. It's delivered to this uh, biofuels plant right here in Watsonville. It's Right there, it's converted to biodiesel, and that biodiesel is being sold to the trucking industry right here in our Central Coast area. And biodiesel has 50% the carbon footprint of regular diesel. So it is reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, it's creating jobs, it's a very clean industry. The only other byproduct besides biodiesel from that process is glycerin. Glycerin is used in makeup, in medicines, and in all kinds of other industries. So uh, that's one application where uh, an existing industry is <coughs> rail. But that is hardly a toxic um, product. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. So I would like to give you an opportunity to give us a closing statement, one to two minutes. Um, we can start with you, Nancy. Before she starts, can I just say something to you? Yes. So you may, your question may not have been answered. If you already put your email on that card, we will get to you. Um, if you didn't, if your, card, your, your question didn't get answered and you wish it had, and you're thinking, oh, I wish I'd put my email on your card, do you want to hand me the cards that didn't get asked? OK, so these are all the ones that did not, we didn't get time to ask. And I will just leave them on the table here. And if you want to find it <coughs> as you go out and put your email on it, I mean, we want to make sure we have the fullest discussion possible. And we just, you know, ran out of time. So if you're feeling like, oh, but my question, put your email on here, and somebody will get back to you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Nancy. 
Well, I would start with cars. <coughs> cars have been an incredible invention that has allowed us to do so many things that have been comfortable and a convenient way to get around. Um, but cars are having, or one of the things having an awful effect on the planet. And I want to think for a minute about the people who are not in the room tonight. For the most part, those of us in the room are li leading pretty comfortable lives. There's some quotes over there about extreme heat in the Pajaro Valley. Um, our driving cars, our burning fossil fuels is directly leading to people suffering all over the world, including in the Pajaro Valley from things like extreme heat. Um, so we actually only have a few years to bring emissions down to zero, as well as remove carbon from the atmosphere. That's the task before us. This is part of making the impossible possible. But I would say we do everything possible. We go for all the solutions, including preserve the rail so that there is an option for public transit on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, please. Um, Raise your hand if you uh, live in the 95076 or 95019 area code. Keep your hand up. Um, you represent about 34% of the population of the county. That means that 34% of us live here in South County and need to get somewhere else. And that's why it's really important that we have transit options. Um, we definitely represent a, a big number of people with a voice, and our voice needs to be heard in the county. Now, if you're under the age of 24, raise your hand. Yeah, we're kind okay. of yes. You represent 40% of the population of South County. 40% of the population of South County is under the age of 24. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. 31% um, of the population of South County is <coughs> under the age of 19. Those young people need options for the future. They're going to need jobs. They're going to need to go to school. They're going to need to get around the county somehow. And we need to provide them with transit options, with housing, with you know, all the things that they need to be able to live in this county. On the other end of the age spectrum, only 17% of the population in this end of the county is over the age of 60. So really we have this huge bulk of the population that is under the age of 24, 25. And we need to look, you know, those of us who are old, need to look to the future for our children or the young people of this county. Um, lastly, it's, you know, having been to the RTC meeting on, on June 14th and having people talk about the, you know, what they wanted and whether they wanted rail or not rail, um, as we go forward, it's really important to consider the needs of the Santa Cruz County as a whole. North County and South County are con you know, considerably different populations and, and um, entities. And it's really important for those governmental agencies to consider the whole county and the needs of the whole county. Um, we represent a good portion of the population here and, and our needs and our, you know, having a goal of healthier, more efficient, and more effective transportation choices is what's going to be serving, especially us in South County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. So recently, you know, having campaigned for a while, uh, a lot of people have talked to me about, you know, that highway over there in, in Highway 1, and the commute times going back and forth on that highway. And, you know, they, not just as a nuisance having to step being stuck in traffic, but they explained it to me in terms of uh, economic perspective. And they tell me that they're stuck on that highway for hour and a half sometimes, hour and ten minutes. You know, and to be able to provide a 30 mi 39 minute solution is something that they would like to see because they have to pay child care costs and they struggle to get their kids to child care in the morning, get back in time 
so that they don't have to pay an extra hour or 20 bucks every day to, to keep their kids in child care. I mean, that could be 400 bucks, you know, 400 to 1,000 bucks a, a month that they're paying in child care that they can save if they had efficient, sustainable transportation. Um, I mean, just the cost of cars, you know, I, it, people don't think about it, but, you know, I, I, think, I think my car is cheap. I don't have any payments on it, but the insurance is $74. I pay $110 in gas every, every month. Uh, there's 55 bucks every two weeks, you know. And insurance, you know, some people got car payments. So it's expensive, and I think that if people can save that money, if people can save child care costs, uh, I think it's going to be something that's going to increase the quality of life for people in Watsonville, and increase the quality of life for people that really need to increase the quality of life, and especially save money. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's kind of you know, my perspective as well. Uh, I think the trail is going to be uh, tremendous. It's going to have also a tremendous impact in our community because South County has, is a destination for a lot of cyclists. There's people that come here from Fresno, all over the place, to ride their bikes out here by Eureka Canyon, Freedom, you know, all, the, all these areas that, where they can ride their bike and see apple orchards, vineyards, they can see strawberries, obviously, forever. And so people come here, and if we can have a, a direct trail that comes from Santa Cruz, people can go ride their bikes here, and then go around to all the tourist locations that we have here, and hopefully have a have a meal here in Watson, while yeah. shopping as well. Um, my take is that I don't want to be sitting, going to a meeting, and like yesterday I went to a meeting in Santa Cruz, and I don't want to be sitting in a meeting 10 years from now, being stuck in traffic and not having any other option. Yeah. Uh, so that's my Thank you. Yeah. Mark, the Thank you. Words? Well, I don't know what I can add to what these great panelists have already said. Um, I think that uh, what I'll say is yeah, I, I've, been, I've been at this game for a long time. I've spent more than 30 years of my life working on public works infrastructure projects. They take time, they cost money, and they're worth it. The project that we have before us today, building this trail and keeping those tracks, has been in the works for 20 years. We are going to break ground this year. We need to stay the course. Let's build that trail that we've been thinking about for 20 years. Let's keep those tracks and develop a commuter rail service that will work for the future. We need to start planning now for where we want to be in 10 years, where we want to be in 20 years. Going backwards and tearing out tracks makes no sense whatsoever. So I will leave you with that. Thank you. Just to give a plug to our library downstairs, um, if you want to see the uh, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network Master Plan, it's downstairs in the library on the second floor. It's right there. Um, all, all those documents are there. And um, you, you can't take them out, but you can sit there and look at them. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful document, so I highly encourage you to look at that. Well, that concludes our meeting. Thank you so much for coming to Watsonville. And I hope this was very helpful, very informative. Also, please make sure if you um, would like to get more information from some of the nonprofits that were here and or not here that you would like to be part of, get more information, please leave your card over there. Also, make sure that you leave your name and phone number if you would like to, more information. And please continue to support this model. We need to keep the rails available. It's a possibility that we cannot close out. And Mark and the other panelists will be available to answer some questions as we clean up for just a couple of minutes. And if you think that Mark, you know, Mark's PowerPoint was like, ooh, my retirement committee or my my work association or my garden club or my community, my neighborhood group would like to see that. Um, you put the name of the group down here at the bottom of the card, and somebody will contact you and try to book Mark to come and present to your organization. So he's he's taken that show on the road, and you know he'll bring it to your club somewhere. Thank you. Thank you.